Well, I want to thank you for promptly taking your seats uh, for our next general session. For this session, we're fortunate to have three leading epileptologists to present. Um, Dr. Andrew Zilgut is an epileptologist with the Henry Ford Health Comprehensive Health Program. He's one of the newest members of their teams, and he sees adults with epilepsy. Dr. Dave Burdett is on his way. He is an epileptologist with St. John Providence Health System's Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. And he also sees adult patients with epilepsy through the Michigan Neurological Institute. Dr. Jules Constantino is a pediatric epileptologist at the Henry Ford Health uh, Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. But what, he's sort of special to us because he comes to Camp Discovery every year um, and spends the entire time with the kids, and we really do appreciate that. I know they have a lot of ground to cover, so I'll get them started with their presentation, Anti-Seizure Medications, Striving for No Seizures, No Side Effects. Who's going first, okay? Um, so I'd like to thank the Epilepsy Foundation uh, for asking me to do this. Um, it's an honor to be here with the amazing people and stories and the exciting research. And it really is an honor to be next to Dr. Constantino and Dr. Burdett when he gets here, uh, since they had very significant impacts on my, my uh, training. Um, <clears throat> my goal is to get through all of the seizure medications in about 20 minutes. And so that's, that's going to be, that's going to be tough. I'm going to fly through a lot of it. Um, the slides are going to be available on the website later. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me afterwards. But I'm not going to read every slide, so I'm just going to hit the high points and try to get through everything fairly quickly. And then Dr. Constantino and Burdett will uh, spend more time kind of going into the nuances of the seizure medications. And since I'm talking about seizure medications, um, I have no financial disclosures other than significant medical debt. And so our, our uh, objectives are really just the fly through everything about seizure medications. We're going to talk about how they work, some important side effects to consider, and then also some unique characteristics. <clears throat> and so um, this uh, was a publication that came out in uh, um, 2012, March 2012. And if you haven't read it, um, it's available online, I believe, for free. It's a great resource, certainly for clinicians, but also for people with epilepsy or family members uh, of people with epilepsy. And in it, they suggested some terminology changes, and one of it was to get away with the term of anti-epileptic drugs. And what they suggested was seizure medications. And as everyone in this room with epilepsy knows, or who's treated epilepsy, or has family members with epilepsy, that it's, it's more than just treating the seizures. There's other facets to the treatment of epilepsy. But certainly paramount to that is control of the seizures. And our first line for that it really is seizure medications. And there was about 22, um, I think up to maybe 25 now. There's some new ones that have just been added just within the last week to the, the treatment options we have. And really, when you look at this, there's been an explosion really since the 1990s with all of uh, the seizure medications available. My dad's a math teacher, so I asked him what kind of combinations could you have if you added all these together. And it's something like 3.41 times 10 to the 29th combinations. And so we could never try all of those because that would be ridiculous. And so Dr. Constantino will uh, spend some time talking about why we choose the ones we do choose. The way I like to break medications up is to think about them in the class of how they work. And probably the best studied class is, uh, or the, the oldest class is the medications that work on sodium channels. And these will all probably sound very familiar to you because they've all been around for a long time. First one is Dilantin. And this works on the fast and activated sodium channels. That might not be all that important really to remember, but it's important when we're choosing medications because some new seizure medications actually work on sodium channels in a different way. This is a very good medication for people with uh, focal seizures or, simple, or uh, uh, partial seizures. And it can also be very effective for people who are having uh, recurrent seizures or are in status epilepticus. It has some significant side effects that can come from it, though. And one of it is that it has a unique way it uh, is broken down. So it, um, it can interact with lots of different medications. Uh, it can also um, cause some changes to the skin. Um, and so you need to be careful when you give this medication. It can also cause changes to the gums. Another medication that's similar to Dilantin is Tegretol. 
or carbamazepine. This works similarly to, to dilantin, um, and it's good for focal seizures and also uh, or, or partial seizures. It has some other side effects that we need to consider if we're using this medication, and that's that it can cause a rash. It's not safe in pregnancy. Um, it, it interacts with lots of different medications, and it can actually um, uh, cause low sodium, so we have to check blood regularly with this medication. Then there's trileptal, which is a cousin of uh, Tegretol. It's called oxcarbazepine, it's the generic name. Works on sodium channels. This is a, uh, another effective medication for focal or partial seizures. And um, it can actually, uh, or it's been approved as a, a first line treatment for children with epilepsy, with certain types of epilepsy. Again, it has some of the same side effects of uh, uh, Tegretol, and that's rash can occur. It can also lower the sodium, it can cause sleepiness, um, and sometimes some upset stomach. Another class of medications um, work on so, or, uh, excuse me, on calcium channels. And there's two medications that are somewhat similar. There's Neurontin and Lyrica. And Neurontin's probably not a very good seizure medication. Um, it's approved for the treatment of seizures. We're not really sure how it works, but we think it might work on, on uh, calcium channels. Uh, for people who have pain syndromes, this is probably a better medication than for people who just have epilepsy. Lyrica works similarly to uh, Neurontin but it's a better seizure medication. And it's also something that you might consider choosing if somebody has a chronic pain syndrome or if they have a diabetic neuropathy because this can, and, and epilepsy because it can kind of treat both of those symptoms. Some of its side effects, though, are important to, uh, to keep in mind. It can cause weight gain, sleepiness, and it can actually lead to swelling in the legs. Another medication is called uh, Zorontin or ethosuximide. This works on calcium channels in a unique way. Uh, and it is probably the best medication for childhood absence epilepsy. I'll show just a couple slides about that in a second. Its side effects primarily are related to upset stomach or, or uh, GI or gastrointestinal side effects. So over the last four years, there's been a group that's really studied this medication and compared it to uh, Lamictal and Depakote. And they found that uh, ethosuximide is a superior medication from the standpoint of seizure control and side effects uh, in the short term and in the long term. Oh, it's not moving. Oh, there we go. Can, there, all right. Um, so another class of medications work on what is called GABA. It's a receptor in the brain. Um, it's also a molecule in the brain that helps keep cells inhibited so they, they're not as excited. So it stops the transmission of uh, uh, seizures. And phenobarbital is one of the classic medications that work in this way. We don't use this as a first line for adults or, or children um, anymore, but we do use it as first line for uh, uh, newborn babies with seizures. In adults, it can have some significant side effects. It can actually lead to respiratory depression, which means you have trouble breathing or you stop breathing. And sometimes in kids, it can actually cause an opposite reaction where they become hyperactive. I put benzodiazepines up here as a class of medications because they all work similarly. And when we talk about some of the newer medications, um, we'll see how these older ones might have some advantages to working for acute seizures, whereas the newer medications might work better as a chronic therapy. Um, the side effects of benzodiazepines are similar to, to phenobarbital. Oh boy. Um, it, they can cause respiratory depression, some sleepiness, um, and they're probably best used for acute seizures and not in the chronic, chronic use of seizures. Can we go to the next slide, please? Just keep hitting return or the green button, thanks. There's two medications that also work on GABA in a different way. There's Sabril, which is a, a medication that uh, was around a while ago and now is back. Um, this medication is approved for treatment of infantile spasms, which are severe seizures in young children. Um, but it can also be effective as a uh, add-on therapy for focal and partial seizures. It has two really important side effects to remember. One of them is reversible. It can cause swelling of the brain, and if you take the medication away, they get better, or the, the swelling reverses. It can cause irreversible peripheral vision loss, and that's vision loss on the side. And so before you take this medication, you have to sign a contract and really monitor vision very closely. Tiagabine is a medication that blocks the uptake of GABA back into the cell, so it makes GABA more available, and then that causes uh, less excitation. 
The, uh, the benefits of this medication are probably as an add-on medication for, for seizure control um, because there's some, some side effects that can happen where you can have prolonged petty mal seizures, either absence or complex partial seizures. It's important to keep that in mind. If we can go to the next slide. So these are medications now that have multiple mechanisms of action. So we've talked about sodium medications, calcium medications, GABA medications, and now these ones have multiple mechanisms of action. The best known one is Depakote. Um, and this is probably uh, the best medication for generalized epilepsies. But it comes with some significant side effects that you always have to consider. It can cause weight gain, a rash, it'll lead to sleepiness, um, and it can even cause tremor in some people, lower blood counts, and it's not safe in pregnancy in general. I think there's some nuances to that, but in general, it's not a safe medication for pregnancy. Felbamate is another medication that works on mul in, in multiple ways. And when this was first approved, it actually ended up getting ta uh, being taken off the market because of some severe uh, reactions where it lowered blood counts and actually was fatal in some cases. So if you're going to start this medication, you need to be aware of those risks. And it's probably the best medication for people who haven't responded to multiple other medications as an add-on therapy. It can also be effective for people with uh, lennox gastaut syndrome. If we can jump to the next slide. So there are two medications here, Lamictal and Keppra. These are somewhat newer medications. Both of them are safe in pregnancy, or thought to be safe in pregnancy, and both are effective for both focal seizures and generalized seizures. Lamictal works in a bunch of different ways, <clears throat> and in some cases it can cause a rash, so you have to start this medication very slowly and increase it slowly um, over several weeks. Keppra is a nice medication because you can give it via IV or in the intravenous form, and it has uh, efficacy or is effective for both focal seizures and generalized seizures. There's some side effects that come with uh, Keppra, and one of them that everybody, I think, becomes more and more aware of is uh, mood changes. And in the reports, it says about 7 to 10 percent. But sometimes in epilepsy clinics, more and more people have uh, mood changes to this. Those mood changes do go away if you take the medication away. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Topamax and Zonagran are similar medications. They're both effective for generalized and focal seizures. They're both also good medications for headache. Um, Topamax has recently been categorized as class D for pregnancy, so it's thought to not be safe during pregnancy. And at high doses of Topamax, you can get some side effects that are very undesirable, confusion and word finding difficulties, and you just feel somewhat dopey. Uh, Zonagran can have similar side effects to, to uh, uh, Topamax, but uh, just not at the frequency or intensity. The nice thing about Zonagran, for some people, you only need to take it once a day because it can last in the blood a long, long time. Jump to the next slide. So all those medications we've talked about have been approved up until the last three or four years. And over the, if you can hit return a couple times. Over the last couple of years, um, there's been a, a goal to come up with rational development. So you target specific mechanisms of action. Instead of just developing a medication that works on sodium channels, you look at other areas that are involved in seizure generation. And so these are fourth generation medications. And when I think of fourth generation, I think of generation four. Go to the next slide. It's a new one. So there are multiple new medications. So go to the next slide. Thank you. I had to return a couple times. So these, these medications work in a couple different ways, or all, all of them work in unique ways. But uh, they all work on suppressing seizure activity. Vimpat <clears throat> works on slow and activated sodium channels. So it's different than all those ones I showed on the first slide, dilantin, tegretol, and trileptal. And the benefit for this might be that it's helpful in acute seizures and status epilepticus, but it's also a very good medication uh, for, for, uh, for focal seizures in general. One thing that we have to monitor, especially if we push the dose to high doses, is the heart rate, because sometimes it can alter the heart rate. Rufinamide or Banzel is a newer medication. Not really sure the mechanism, but they think it might work on sodium channels. Um, this one has been approved for treatment in uh, lennox gastaut syndrome, or seizures associated with lennox gastaut syndrome, particularly the drop seizures. But it probably is also helpful as an add-on therapy for focal seizures. Jump to the next slide, please. Potiga uh, is a newer medication that works completely different than any other seizure medication available. And it works on potassium channels. 
And because it has this new mechanism of action, it has some new side effects that we're not really used to seeing regularly. It can cause some movement disorders, particularly a tremor. Sometimes it can actually lead to um, uh, um, urinary retention, so trouble using the bathroom. And recently there's been reports that it can cause changes to the retina or eyes and also cause blue skin discoloration. This is likely an effective medication for add-on to people with focal seizures. Clobazam or Onfi is a 1,5 benzodiazepine. So it works complete, it, it has a different chemical structure than the benzodiazepines we talked about earlier. It still works on the, the GABA receptor, but it's thought to work in a different way where it has better anticonvulsant properties and maybe less side effects. And one of the things that can happen with uh, conventional benzodiazepines, Valium, Ativan, or, or Clonopin, is you can develop tolerance and dependence. And that seems to be less common with, uh, with Onfi. It's been approved by the FDA recently here in the United States, but it's been around since 1966 in Australia, uh, France, Europe, and Canada. So it has a lot of evidence that it's an effective and safe medication. Go to the next slide, please. Vicampa is a medication that was approved by the FDA in 2012, but unfortunately, at supra-therapeutic doses, what that means is at two and three times the approved doses, it made people feel euphoric, and so there's a concern that it might make might be habit forming. So the DEA has had it for the last year to come up with a schedule for it and hasn't done it. And the pharmaceutical company now is suing the DEA to get this to market. The clinical trials look very promising and it uh, works in a unique way. It works on AMPA receptors and because it works on AMPA receptors, it might have some unique properties where it can be helpful with uh, uh, conditions like headache or migraine or even Parkinson's disease. And just last Saturday, I saw on epilepsy.com that eslicarbazepine was approved. This medication's a uh, derivative of carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine, so it works on sodium channels, similarly to other medications we've talked about. The clinical trials were somewhat modest, but uh, the clinical trials for Keppra, I believe, were so somewhat modest, and that's been a great medication. So there's hope that this might be a very good medication for lots of people. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is just the to show that uh, the drug company for Ficampa is suing the DEA uh, to get this to market. And at 12 milligrams in the clinical trials, about 50% of people withdrew from the study because of side effects. So it's unlikely that you'd be able to get a dose this high. Uh, so it's unlikely that this is a concern that there's any uh, addictive properties. Go to the next slide, please. So the FDA approved uh, eslicarbazepine. I saw this last weekend. And if we jump ahead one more slide, there are multiple medications that are still in, that are in development and going on in clinical trials right now. An exciting medication is Brevaracetam. This works similarly to Levetiracetam and Keppra, but it has a couple other ways it works. And it might be actually helpful as a generalized, uh, a medication for generalized epilepsies. Go to the next slide, please. And so in August, there was an announcement that there's 28 new seizure medications in development, all with rational targets. Um, to, to try to treat epilepsy and, or treat the seizures in a different way. We go to the next slide. So our goal is to hit return for me. If the epilepsy strikes back, our goal is with one more thing, new seizure medications. We go to the next slide. We'll jump to seizure freedom and no side effects. Thank you. going to be a tough act to follow there. <laughs> um, so I'm David Burdett, and um, I'm going to talk today about uh, something of a hot button topic, which is generics. So Dr. Zilgit has given a, a very nice comprehensive review of anti-epileptic medications, which as you know are the mainstay of our treatment of epilepsy. And, uh, and has nicely reviewed the mechanisms of action. How do these seizure medications work? How are they stopping seizures? And that is, in many ways, the, the crux of the matter. But if we go back to very simplistic terms, uh, to just sort of basics, uh, we have to somehow be able to get these medications. And many of these medications can be prohibitively expensive. <laughs> 
And once we get them, they have to be able to get into our system. So this talk is going to revolve around the expense of medication, but I'm not going to go into to great detail about numbers, but just the general concept of how we insurers and whatnot pay for the medications, and are there any issues that arise when we... Gracious. See, I'm trying to match Dr. Zilgit here. Uh, he has those great Star Wars clips, so I just have bangs. It is deer hunting season, though. So, um, uh, so with that, I will get going. And just to remind everyone that uh, th this is a rather busy slide, but I want you to look at the bottom portion there, and that is a curve looking at the incidence of epilepsy over the lifespan. And one point to remember is that epilepsy is not just a disorder that is, occurs between the ages of 24 and 35, which uh, interestingly is where many of our generics are tested, but this is a disorder that is over the lifespan. And as we all know, the goal is freedom from seizures. So. Generics. By way of background, maybe I'll carry this with me, maybe I'll point it toward me. Here we go. By way of background, uh, a large percentage of our gross national product, if you will, goes to uh, medical costs, and a large percentage of that goes to, thank you very much, I tend to wander. <coughs> A large percentage of that tends to go to um, uh, medications, and included amongst those are anti-epileptic medications. And I'm going to talk what I, about what I consider answers and questions. So the answers that we have about generics, what we know about generics is that every day, several million tablets of generic anti-epileptic medications are used by people with epilepsy. And um, that it is estimated that 56.7 billion per year is saved by generic substitution. So these are not numbers to sneeze at. Um, that generics do play an interesting and important role in the treatment of any number of medical disorders, including epilepsy. And they, they provide clear cost saving. The questions arise, uh, advocacy groups, uh, physicians, patients will argue that maybe we don't want to indiscriminately use these medications. Maybe for, for a certain subset or a large number of people, generic substitution is going to be well tolerated and, and effective, but there may be groups who we don't want to, to give generics. Uh, the FDA counters that there is no reliable documentation that generic substitution has provided any ill effects. I'm going to throw a little bit of basic science at you. I promise I won't do too much. I know that the two quickest ways to clear a room are to yell fire or to threaten to talk about uh, basic neuropharmacology. Uh, so I'm going to keep it really simple here. In essence, if you, if you can prove that two drugs are equivalent, they're the same drug, the same compound, the same fillers, one costs the tenth the cost of the other, or a fifth the cost of the other, we're going to take the cheaper one. It makes sense. So the FDA has a process whereby pharmaceutical companies can present their compounds and try to show that they are the same as a more expensive branded product. They do this by doing typically single dose studies uh, and these are in healthy adults who are on no other medications, and typically between the ages of 24 to 36, and these patients do not have epilepsy. And with this single dose, they're going to look at how that medication is absorbed. And with any medication, whenever we take a medication, we, for the first dose, started a level of zero in our system, 
and then our body absorbs it. And within typically one to two hours, that dose will peak if it's not an extended release preparation, and then it'll be gradually metabolized. So what the FDA, FDA looks at is the C-max. The C-max is the maximal concentration of that medication, because that can be important. Uh, if your C-max is too high, you may get side effects. They also look at what we call the area under the curve, that grayed out area over there, and that lets us know how much of this medication was absorbed. So if our brand name medication has a nice absorption and gradually falls off, but our generic medication goes up and comes back down, the C-max looks pretty good, but there just isn't that much delivered to the system. But the FDA argues that with a single dose, in healthy individuals of middle age, if you will, uh, young individuals, um, that if that curve is almost superimposable on a brand name medication, then that generic will get the stamp of imprimatur from the FDA that it can be marketed. There are some guidelines. Whenever we take even a branded medication, let's say 100 milligrams of a branded medication, we're probably not getting exactly 100 milligrams. We're getting pretty darn close to 100 milligrams. The U.S. Pharmacopeia says that with any given brand, you have to be plus or minus 7 percent. Most drugs are going to be plus or minus 2 to 3 percent. So when we take 100 milligrams of drug X, we're probably getting somewhere between 98 and 102 milligrams, which that's just the nature of biology. With a potential generic medication, we want with what's called a 90% confidence interval for that medication to hit somewhere between 80%, for so that 100 milligram tablet, that would be 80 milligrams, or um, 125 milligrams. So a little bit of a wider swing. So with the brand name up there on the top, you've got a rather tight, right around 100%. It's 100 milligrams, you're almost right in there at 100%. Let's look at B, the equivalent generic, uh, you might get on the right, on the left side a, an 83 to 90 milligrams on a given dose. And that would be okay because it's within that 80 to 125 percent. Or you might get on the other side 105 to 122 milligrams. That's still okay because it's within that broad guideline from the FDA. The third line down, though, it's clearly outside. Either the first drug here, the weak version, or the strong version is not going to be FDA approved uh, as, a, um, as a generic. And then in the bottom one, we've got too much overlap. There's too much of a wide swing. So these are the basic principles. We want to have two drugs that are roughly equivalent, and this is the definition of equivalence. Now, there is a concept of narrow therapeutic index drugs, of which in the U.S., anti-epilepsy medications are not included. Uh, in Denmark, I believe, that if you want to become a generic medication, you have to fit between 90 and 110 percent, not 80 and 125 percent. So there are some things you can quibble with, but these are the definitions that we're left with. So this is an ad from the FDA, and so it appears that uh, generic drugs, safe, effective, FDA approved within these guidelines, you know, may, maybe this is the answer. Maybe my talk is over right now, but maybe not. Uh, well, let's talk about some perceptions. There are a number of uh, studies that um, have polled patients and physicians and have indicated that more often, more patients than physicians actually have a level of comfort with generics, but that many treating physicians have this intrinsic level of discomfort that 
this 80 to 125 percent is stringent enough. There's just this little, um, just not quite okay with that. Uh, and a number of patients are not okay with that as well. I suspect, although you can't necessarily glean this from the study, that patients who may have had one or two seizures and have been well controlled for years on or off generics probably have not had an issue with generics and that patients with more difficult to control seizures do have issues. But regardless, there are some perceptions out there that maybe my, uh, my little uh, ad for a generic from the FDA may be overstating the case. So how applicable is this testing? Well, it is in healthy adults, no other medications. They don't have epilepsy. Now, presumably, their gut, their GI system with which they absorb their medications works the same as the GI system of someone who has epilepsy, but we don't know that for a fact. Um, when the FDA analyzed a number of these studies before 1997, and a few of these slides I have to thank Dr. Brian Smith, who provided these for me. He um, is much more expert than I on this topic, so if you have in-depth questions, uh, he would be an excellent resource. He's actually testified in, fun, in front of uh, congressional committees on this issue. Um, they found, the FDA found, when looking at their data before 1997, that most generic medications were within four and a half or so percent of that C-max, that top, that peak level or concentration, and that the um, extent of absorption, the area under the curve, was within about three and a half percent. Other questions have been raised, however, that, and this is driven by advo advocacy groups, physicians, and concerned patients who uh, have uh, uh, pushed for more analyses of this. Uh, unfortunately, most of those analyses have been retrospective analyses, looking at data from the past and then crunching that data. And the FDA, although interested in retrospective analyses, uh, doesn't accept those as proof. They want to see a prospective study where you take a cadre of patients and you randomize them to either get the brand name drug or a generic drug and you prove for once and for all, are generics well tolerated? And for the most part, these retrospective, looking back type of analyses have indicated that there are some questions here, that maybe uh, there are more side effects. There's a, a study from Canada, uh, from the Andermans, who uh, found that when Lamotrigine hit the market as a generic, that uh, there was a, uh, a higher rate, about 10% of patients would come back because of adverse events and demand to go back on the brand name medication. I wasn't exactly, it wasn't obtainable, the information, what adverse effects they were having, more seizures, uh, more side effects, but nevertheless, they found this uh, with Lamotrigine. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Labiner uh, looked at a large population of patients with his group and found that the uh, that generic usage of antiepileptic medications was associated with greater issues, medical rela medically related issues. So going to the emergency department, seizures that required uh, medical attention. So questions have been raised. Um, Greg Krauss and his group at Johns Hopkins went back and actually looked at the data that had been submitted to the FDA about these drugs. And roughly speaking, you don't want to be in the red. If you're in the red, there could be an issue. And they found that generally speaking, that generics are close to brand name, 
but that when you compare taking a generic, say, on an empty stomach and a brand name on an empty stomach versus uh, after having eaten, that you could find differences with the C-max, the maximal concentration. And their conclusion was that it's in most people, not necessarily across the board, but in most people, they will tolerate a conversion from a brand name to a generic. The issue arises, though, when you go from generic to generic. So conclusions. There is indirect evidence that product switching, uh, switching either between generics or from brand name to generic, may have an adverse outcome. It may produce an increase in side effects. It may have an adverse effect on seizure control. But we don't have definitive data. So this is still uh, a, a, an area where many people feel very strongly about it, but we just need more data. There are three studies that are planned, at least one of which is already ongoing, to try to address these issues. And eventually, we will have these answers. But right now, there is a lot that we don't know. There are many more questions than answers. One other uh, uh, point I'll make before I conclude is that factors that are going to be investigated include how soluble, how easy is, is it to dissolve this medication, um, different, a generic and a brand name may have a different way that the medication is delivered to the system, either in a salt form or whatever. The, uh, the binders, the supposedly inert substances that are within the pill or the capsule, the tablet, are going to be different amongst generics. Does this play a role? In theory, it shouldn't, but it may. And um, a lot to lot, so the variability from one set of pills to the next. And storage effects. Do medications that are bound together in a different fashion not last as long as each other? Uh, do they lose effectiveness? But finally, uh, the, the major issue is going to be, let's say that you have a medication that is on the weaker end of things, and you're getting about 85 milligrams instead of your 100 milligrams. And so you maybe have uh, some, some se a seizure, perhaps. So your medication is adjusted. You find that happy medium. And then you are switched in a few months to a stronger medication that is, let's say, 115 milligrams. That's a pretty significant swing. That is well over a, uh, that's almost a 25% swing in your uh, total amount of medication, and that could become an issue. You may then have side effects, so then you readjust your dose, and then the next month you're back to the lower one, and so as you can see, this can be an issue. So the data, does suggest that if you're within this therapeutic range as defined by the FDA, you should be an equivalent medication. But we know that that data does have some issues. It is tested in a population that you can't necessarily extrapolate to the epilepsy population. And there are a number of factors. These people are not being tested on daily dosing. They're being tested on a single dose. So there are more, many more questions than answers. And I'll draw the, conclu or draw the analogy. This is my youngest brother, 13 years my junior. And he is an opera singer by trade. Uh, spends most of his time in New York singing with the Met. But it is. Um, unless you're a big headliner, and he's not a big headliner, uh, he has to travel around doing gigs around the country. And he was uh, doing um, a gig with the Seattle Opera a couple of years ago and was asked to sing the national anthem at a Seattle Mariners baseball game. So the appearance would be that, well, fair crowd there. You can kind of see him blurred out in the background. 
So he's getting a little bit of exposure, but alas, there was really no one there. Um, so uh, appearances can be deceiving, and it's going to depend from the angle at which you're looking at this question. So from the simplistic angle, generics between 80% and 125%, they should be equivalent. But if when we look at it with more detail and we indiscriminately apply this to all patients, then suddenly that starts to break down, specifically in the setting of pregnancy, more difficult to control epilepsy, uh, patients who are well controlled but driving. So as you can see, alas, there are more questions than answers. So having uh, heard many answers from Dr. Zilget and, uh, and much better sound effects, all I had was a quasi gunshot. Um, and, um, uh, and a lot more questions than answers. Uh, I will turn things over to Dr. Constantino, who will provide a lot more answers than questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And um, I want to thank Arlene and Russ and everybody uh, from the Epilepsy Foundation for, for this wonderful venue. Um, it's a wonderful turnout. And um, hopefully we can all work together to achieve this goal of um, uh, that we all strive with uh, no seizures and no side effects. It's, it's a pleasure to, to share the podium with Dr. Bedette, who knows a lot and a lot and a lot about anti-seizure medications, and also with Dr. Zilgit. Um, Dr. Bedette comes first, of course, given the seniority issues. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, we, I think we sort of <laughs> a match on that. On that. Um, so, um, as Andy's told us, there are so many medications which have uh, become available uh, in the last two decades, and all of them seem to work a little bit different. And uh, so, you know, the question for, for us who deal with seizures and who deal with epilepsy is how do we use all these tools? And is there a better way that we can use tools to maximize um, a seizure protection? And, uh, and I think especially in childhood, and I'm going to address mostly pediatric perspectives, where one of my prime goals and one of the family's prime goals is how do we preserve our cognitive abilities and our neurodevelopmental outlook? Because um, you know, seizure disorders affect the brain. Um, so you know, when I'm seeing my uh, residents um, and you know, on their first day, or some of the Wayne State medical students, uh, the first thing we talk about is the rule of 60s. What is epilepsy and how common is it? And we know that it's common. And, uh, you know, the rule of 60s, it's epilepsy is a pediatric disorder. 60% of the time it begins in childhood. 60% of the time it's smooth sailing. And, um, you know, we can stop the seizures with the first or the second medication that we try. And 60% of kids will outgrow the epilepsy. But unfortunately, as, as we all know too well, um, epilepsy is not always smooth sailing. Uh, it's often a rough ride. 20%, um, 30% of the time, we have to try one medication. We try combinations, and, and the question is, are they combinations? D Dr. Zulgit told us about you know, medications which work on sodium channels, medications which work on GABA. Is there a combination? Um, that, that might be more effective. And, um, you know, we think about drug resistance, which unfortunately uh, about 20% of epilepsy is medically intractable. We can't stop seizures with, uh, med uh, with medication. Are we moving on the slides? Can we, can we move one slide? Move on the next slide. Um, so we should be on the Brody study. Um, so the Brody study... Um, is a, is, is a rather old study now. I think it was published in 1992. Um, but what it taught us was we can predict drug resistance or medical intractability fairly early. Um, 
in adults. And I'm not so sure whether or not the same issues apply in childhood, but what the Brody study uh, taught us was that you know, if you have seizures and if you still have seizures after we've tried one or two medications, uh, the chances that another medication will make you seizure free is probably only of the order of 10%. So the deeper that you reach into the bag, the less likely you are to get seizure free, which is what we want. And then the question becomes, um, how can we use these tools to optimize outcome? And I think for children who tend to have broad spectrum epilepsies, who tend to have generalized seizure uh, types, who tend to have a diversity of seizures, myoclonic, absence, and atonic, um, the Brody study might be a little bit simplistic because I believe that for kids with what we call mixed seizure syndromes, there are maybe some combinations which are effective, but that's just what I think and it's not what I know. Um, so those are the pediatric challenges. Uh, most of the medications that have been approved have been approved in add-on studies for adults with partial seizures. So um, when we think about how, what is the application of a particular medication in a child with a particular seizure type, a lot of times it's like um, what people like me without much hair think and, and what we tell Andy and Andy says, well, Dr. Constantino used to say, you've got to try this for absent seizures and that's what Dr. Zilgit does is because I told him to. Um, so uh, we're going to explore some of those issues. Um, next slide. Uh, so, monotherapy is the mantra, um, um, you know, that's always what we, we shoot for, is, is one drug, a seizure free, uh, but unfortunately when we're dealing with medical intractability, um, we think about combining medications and many of, um, sometimes quite embarrassing, you know, when I have medical students in, in my clinic and I say, well, you know, we, one, one drug is the best, and then they come in and one child has three or four seizures and the next child is on three or four medications and well, you know, and then we try and take some things away and the seizures come back. So sometimes it's, it's, it's obligatory polytherapy. We need lots of medications. Is it rational? Uh, do sodium channel medications work better with GABA medications? Uh, we just don't know the answer. And, but the question is, can one and one make three? So if you have one medication and another medication, and can it improve your seizure control? And actually, this is not a new idea, it's an old idea. Um, Gowers is sort of like the father of, of pediatric neurology, and um, what he wrote was the combination of bromides, and we use, that's probably the, the, the oldest anti-epilepsy medication, um, uh, with other drugs are of much value in the treatment of epilepsy. In many cases, a greater effect is produced. And do you any, does anyone know what he was using besides the opium? Uh, so, well, that was one of the things he was using, bromides, opium, and cannabis. So are things turning around a little bit? Um, so I want to look at a, a, at a particular epilepsy syndrome and so that we can look at how studies, and I think that's what we need, is we need more studies to help to show us how to use a particular medication. So childhood absence epilepsy, typical absence epilepsy, most of you probably know it as classic pedimol, is an age-related epilepsy syndrome. Um, you know, epilepsy changes with time and it changes with maturity. And, and we see it in middle age, in mid-childhood, between five to 10 years of age. Um, typically, the kids have the absence seizures, very brief staring seizures, just seconds, a little bit of eyelid flickering, upward rolling of the eyes. Typically, dozens of seizures a day. We call it pycnolepsy. It's easy to diagnose. Um, when we do an EEG, we see a normal background. We see a three per second spike in slow wave. And, um, you know, uh, when we saw uh, a child that we thought had pedimol, that had childhood absence epilepsy, we could say to the family, well, this is a good epilepsy to have. Uh, there's a 90% chance that you're going to outgrow it. Um, why do we need to treat? Um, you know, you can injure yourself during an absence seizure. If you're uh, playing t-ball and you suddenly freeze, you might get hit in the head. 
in lots of absences, maybe they'll impact on your learning and attention. And, and there was a bit of confusion because if you look at the old, uh, the 1988 International League Against Epilepsy uh, description of absence seizures, what they said was that 10% of kids that had absence seizures had grand mal seizures, had generalized tonic clonic seizures. So what, what medications did we have available? We had the Depakote. And Depakote is effective against absences and against grand miles, against generalized tonic-clonic seizures. But, but I had this prejudice for many years because a lot of kids with epilepsy, 30 40%, also have an attentional disorder or an ADHD where it's hard for them to tune in and focus. And I thought that um, the Depakote made the ADD worse. So I didn't like that medication. And then there were the other side effects that Dr. Zilger told us about, you know, weight gain, hair loss. Um, um, Zerontin was a good medication for absence seizures, but it didn't cover the, the grand miles. Um, so my favorite choice for many years was Lamictal because I thought it, it was good, or Lamotrigine, I thought it was good for absences and I thought it was good for generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So um, this was a NIH study um, and uh, it was a lot of centers that collaborated and that's what we need. And it was a double-blind study. Uh, next slide, please. I keep forgetting. Um, so, yeah, here we go. D a double-blind study with 453 children. And um, these children were randomized uh, to treatment either with ethosuximide or with lamotrigine or with valproic acid or Depakote. Um, and there were the primary outcome measure was treatment failure, and it was a good definition of treatment failure. The, the, the definition included how many of the kids became seizure-free, and then the other part of the equation was the side effect issue. And what they were looking at was uh, what was the effect on the medications on those attentional aspects. And um, so that was the secondary outcome measure. Um, so we talked, next slide, we talked about the freedom from treatment failure. Um, you know, you had, it was treatment failure if you still had absences after 16 or 20 weeks. If you had generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and actually what this study has shown in our thinking about childhood absence epilepsy has changed in the last 20 years, and we've come to recognize that in classic pedimal, in classic childhood absence, generalized tonic-clonic seizures are relatively infrequent. If you have generalized seizures, if you have grand mal seizures, it's probably not childhood absence. Um, and in this study, there were only eight children out of the 453 that actually had grand mal seizures. And then they looked at the other things that might indicate treatment failure. Depakote many times increases appetite and we get weight gain, so that was treatment failure. Or if your platelet count uh, was too low. Um, and the next slide. And as it turns out, when the study came out, I was right about one thing and I was wrong about the other. So I guess 50% ain't bad. Uh, so, um, and so what they found was, in terms of freedom from treatment failure, and this is a common thing in, in epilepsy, is how do we strive for that balance between seizure control and side effects, treatment failure or successful treatment we saw only in 50% of the kids. The other 50% of the kids either had ongoing seizures or had side effects from medication. So these are medications, they're potent medications, and sometimes there's a price to pay for the medications. Um, uh, lack of seizure control though, it turned out that ethosuximide, and Zeron ethosuximide or Zerontin, um, and um, Valproic acid or Depakote were the best for your absence seizures. Uh, we got seizure control in about, five, about uh, five out of six kids. Lamictal or Lamotrigine, seizure control was achieved only in about half. Now I have, I don't know that they used as much Lamictal as they used as the other medications, um, but certainly um, Lam uh, Depakote and, and uh, um, 
of aproic acid and ethosuximide uh, were superior in terms of efficacy. The next slide, the next thing they looked at um, was they looked at the secondary outcome and um, they looked at something called, so every child had not only a seizure analysis with you know, histories and video EEG monitoring uh, to look and see if they had ongoing seizures, but they also did something that they call continuous performance testing, which is a very boring, repetitive, mundane thing which looks at something that we call sustained attention. Um, as we said, a lot of kids uh, with absence epilepsy have difficulty tuning in and focusing, staying on task. And what they found here uh, was that Depakote or valproic acid seemed to make attention worse about 50% of the time. So the kids that were on valproic acid didn't do well, that were on the Depakote, didn't do well in terms of the attention, um, whereas the uh, ethosuximide and the lamictal were relatively neutral, but still see about 20% or 30% of kids uh, did have attentional difficulties. Um, and what was interesting also was that whether or not you had attentional difficulties did not seem to relate to the degree of seizure control. So this is part of the biology of, of, of epilepsy is there's an immaturity of cortical networks and one way and you know absence seizures are generated in the frontal lobes they fire together so one manifestation of the frontal lobe immaturity is seizures the other manifestation is the attentional disorder so even in the presence of seizure control, um, many kids still had an attention deficit to disorder. So the outcome seems to be that, so now when I see a child with absence seizures, I have the study that I can fall back on and I can say, well, you know, the two best medications are ethosuximide and valproic acid. But if we look at the effect of the medications on attention and focus at school, it seems that um, ethosuximide is better. So that now, I think for most neurologists, um, uh, is the treatment of choice. So now Andy sort of ignores what I said five years ago. He just looks at the New England Journal of Medicine article and says Constantino was wrong about one thing and right about the other. So. Um, so let's look at another syndrome, and this is Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So childhood absence epilepsy um, is an example of a, an easy epilepsy syndrome, if you want, in a, in a sense, where it's often easy to obtain seizure control. There's a good prognosis to remission. Uh, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome is a very tough epilepsy. I don't know if there are any families here who I live with Lennox Gusteau. Can we have a show of hands? Do I see any? No, not really. But so anyway, a common epilepsy. Well, not that common. Um, about three percent to eight percent of children, or uh, have uh, Lennox Gusteau. Again, it's age-related. It presents in early childhood, and we see a mixture of seizure types: drop attacks, uh, nods. Drops, nods, blinks, and jerks. So the drops are drop attacks. These are kids that have the toughest of the tough epilepsy. They're in helmets. Um, you know, they, they suddenly fall to the ground. Um, we sustain injuries. Uh, we have nods, little head nods, little head drops. Uh, blinks, which are atypical absences, which are absence seizures like we see in childhood absence. Um, and then jerks, which are myoclonic seizures. The EEG shows a slow background. Remember, in childhood absence, we have a normal background, and, during, and then we see slow spike and wave. So in childhood absence, you see a three per second spike and slow wave discharge, whereas in lennox gastro you see a two to two and a half hertz. So when we see the slow spike and wave, this tells us this could be a difficult uh, epilepsy. So again, as we identify the syndrome, um, you know, it helps us predict the outcome of the epilepsy. This is an epilepsy where many, many times we have to try many medications. Many of the kids are on two or three or four medications. 
This is truly what we call a childhood epileptic encephalopathy. So if we look at kids with Lenos Gusto, uh, some of them have serious brain injuries like tuberosclerosis, um, cerebral palsy. About a third are what we call cryptogenic, normal kids that for some reason suddenly develop this catastrophic epilepsy. So if we look at kids with Lenox Gusto, um, at the onset, um, about a third to the fifth are developmentally normal. As you follow the children, the epilepsy persists into the adult years, and 75, at least 75 percent have significant cognitive impairments uh, and are not able to live independently. So uh, this tells us about the devastation that epilepsy can sometimes have in childhood. Uh, next slide. So again, there's no comprehensive drug studies, there's no head-to-head -head studies. We really don't know, you know, how do we use Vimpat? Does that work in Lennox Gusto? I don't know, because it's not been studied in Lennox Gusto or Lecosamide. Um, and a lot of it, as I said, is empiric. Though I think to give the the drug companies, and I think a lot of them are often much maligned, but um, uh, there have been studies in Lennox Gusto with some of the newer medications. Um, so the, the studies of the lamotrigine, topiramate, felbamol, uh, felbamate, uh, rufinamide, um, and clobazam or onfi. Um, uh, so these are the studies which have led to FDA approval uh, for these medications in Lennox Gusto syndrome. Um, what's surprising, though, is that even though we have these new medications, if you look at uh, many of the drugs, uh, Depakote or valproic acid is still the most commonly prescribed medication for lennox gastaut syndrome. It is very effective, but you know how, how does it measure up in terms of side effects? We, we just don't know the answer. Um, so we prefer generalized medications, and, and the medications I've listed, I also like zonogram or zonisamide. Um, so these are broad spectrum medications which are effective um, mostly for, which some of them are effective for partial seizures as well as Dr. Zilger told us, but they also have a broad spectrum, so they're effective both for partial and for generalized seizures. Um, the question becomes, as, as I've said, how do we try the other medication? Vimpad, I, I think it probably doesn't work for uh, Lennox Gastaut. It's a partial medication. It works on sodium channels. Um, but again, we don't know for sure. And next slide. So there are some double-blind control studies um, of these newer medications in Lennox Gastaut. Um, you know, and, and one of the gold standards that we look at in any study is called the median seizure reduction rate. Uh, most studies are add-on protocols. So you're all already on one or two or three medications, and we add on something else. And then what we look at is the median seizure reduction rate. So what proportion of kids get a 50% reduction in seizures? And again, uh, for each lamictal or lamotrigine, um, we, there's about a 30% reduction. Very similar figures, mostly a 30%, 40%. Um, so they're all useful, and they do cut back on the drop attacks. Um, um, but no medication is, is perfect. Felbitol, or felbamate, which uh, Dr. Zilgit told us about, probably not used as much, though uh, pediatric neurologists are using it more and more when we rarely are up against it. Um, uh, but a very effective medication, 50% uh, uh, have a 50% reduction in seizure frequency, uh, but there's the issue of the aplastic anemia and the liver toxicity, so you need to closely monitor blood counts. Uh, with Lamictal, uh, you have to build it up very slowly. A few kids can be uh, allergic to it. It can be uh, potentially dangerous. So we want a very slow buildup of the lamictal. It's almost like allergy shots. We give it to you so that you get used to it, and then we can build up on it. Next slide. Uh, rufinamide, or Banzel, which is, uh, works on the, as Dr. Zulgert told us, um, 
So some of the, I, I should reference Dr. Bidet's talk. Um, so, you know, rufinamide is only available as brand name because it's, it's only been available for three years. Most of these drugs have a patent for, you know, five, ten years. Um, uh, but Banzel works on slow sodium channels. It's effective um, in, um, in cutting back the drop attacks. Onfi or clobazam is a benzodiazepine, actually fairly effective. Uh, you can see in the high dose arm, you can get quite an, an impressive uh, reduction in uh, median seizure frequency, up to 77%, but it's a benzodiazepine, so a lot of times there's side effects like sedation, lethargy, drooling. Uh, next slide. Um, so a tough, tough epilepsy, many times we think about a multiplicity of medications. We want to think about non-pharmacologic options early on. Uh, corpus callosotomy, which is a surgery which will reduce drop attacks by 50%, 80% of the time. Vagus nerve stimulation, which is variable effectiveness uh, according to the study study that you read, between 20% to 80% get a 50% reduction in seizures. Ketogenic diet, which is effective uh, for the first year, but many times the efficacy of the diet seems to wane. Um, just, I'll be very quick with the Dravet syndrome. Oh, um, so Dravet syndrome, um, uh, we'll just skip through that slide. If anyone has questions about it, um, well, I'll be available after. Uh, but certainly, uh, next slide, um, there's some medications, Topamax, uh, Keppra, um, uh, Depakote, I think is helpful, Steripental. Then can we just go to the second last slide? Um, uh, so the mixed seizure syndromes of early childhood. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, so we have a lot of tools. And I think it's still hard to know how to use the tools. Um, you know, when I'm seeing a child, I like to think about the seizure type. Is it a myoclonic seizure? Is it an absence seizure? Is there a tonic seizure? And I like to think about, uh, you know, different medications for the particular seizure type. Sometimes it's guesswork. Um, we do tend to avoid sodium channel blockers for, for the mixed seizure types. The next slide. Um, so the holy grail is the balance between seizure control and side effects. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is optimal seizure control? And what are acceptable side effects? So, you know, for a child that has um, many, many disabilities, um, you know, I don't think it's important to absolutely stop every, every seizure because we don't want, you know, I think what you have to think, what's the price that you pay in terms of, of side effects? And, you know, in that situation where it's hard to get seizure control, maybe the occasional seizure, provided it's not leading to injury, is acceptable, and we don't want to be doping up our kids to stop every seizure. Um, and uh, we've talked about, uh, you know, rational trial, how tri uh, irrational is it? Next slide. Um, so we've talked about obligatory polytherapy. The crossover trap, I think, is important for us to be aware of. You know, when we're looking at these difficult epilepsies and when we add on another medication, two medications may be more effective but may also probably also have more side effects. So when we add that second medication, the side effects that we see are not always a result of that second medication. It might be what we call an additive side effect. So, you know, you need to cut back on the first medication. Um, so the care team is an important part of the treatment of any child with a difficult epilepsy. And what's important is communication and dialogue. And, you know, pediatric care is triangular. We have the doctor, we have the child, and we have the parents. And I think what's always important is for us to try to include the child in the dialogue, because a lot of times we forget. Um, and I, I try not to, but sometimes we're all, 
you know, we, as we're sitting in the office, I think it's important that we never ever, and I think the Epilepsy Foundation does a wonderful job of doing this, of not relegating the child. We need to think about the children, we need to think about their needs and their perspectives, and I think things like Camp Discovery uh, and the day camp that we have today are, are wonderful tools to, to help our kids who deal with very tough epilepsy. So our goal in the long term should be to maximize seizure control, to maximize neurodevelopmental outcomes, and to maximize quality of life. Thank you. Well, I think we should give another round of applause to our speakers, Dr. Constantino, Dr. Zilgut, and Dr. Burdett. 